Mufferds. Last week I built this IS-2 and gave it a very special treatment that turned it into a playground of steel textures. We have cast steel, welds, imperfections on the surface and much more. All of that provides us a very interesting surface for painting and that's exactly what we're about to do. So let's give it a shot, shall we? Remember in the last video how I added a securing nut into the hull? Well, because of it, I can now attach the model to this Octopus M2M painting stand. At first I was skeptical about it, but now it's one of my favorite tools. There's even another holder for the turret, so I can keep the surface clean during the entire painting stage. The remaining parts, such as the wheels, are easily impaled on toothpicks because they have a poly cap inside of each wheel. And what about some of the details that can't be held so easily? Well, here I usually make a small hole somewhere that's not gonna be visible and then use super glue. Once it's painted and placed on the model, none of that is gonna be visible. Okay, prime time. I wanted to use a dark brown primer on this tank, but just my luck, I'm running out of it and there wouldn't be enough. Well, so it's gonna be my usual black surfacer as usual. Most of you already know the age-old mantra that I keep repeating all the time, right? How the black primer creates a perfect foundation for post-shading because it allows us to easily add artificial shadows and other contrasting elements to the paintwork. Yeah, but with this model, the priming stage felt more special than usual. Why is that? Well, because all of those textures I meticulously crafted a week ago, I just knew all of them were there, but most of them were hard to see. The surface primer unifies everything and gives it a nice satin finish. And all of a sudden, all those different textures, ranging from super smooth to extra gnarly, are gonna pop. I think it's safe to say that all the effort that went into making these cast imperfections and whatnot definitely paid off. Moving on, let's get the basic color. This is my favorite 4BO ever, and the manufacturer is based in my country. I just find the dropper applicator a little bit inconvenient, to say the least, so it's easier to remove the lid and pour the paint out. MRP paints are pure lacquers and they come ready for airbrushing. This means they're pre-diluted so you don't have to mess around with thinners. And I think that's very convenient. It might even give you a good idea about how thin your paints should be, so next time you're working with, I don't know, Tamiya paints, you'll know how much thinner you'll need. On the other hand, paints such as this might run out pretty fast. IS-2 is not the biggest tank, but it ain't tiny either, and still I spent almost half a bottle for the entire painting process. I just love this shade of 4B, okay? I'm not an expert, but I think it hits that sweet spot between green, khaki and brown, and it's very pleasing to my eyes. So, to post shade the tank, I'll add yellow green and some clear varnish to the 4BO. The clear varnish keeps the paint satin and saturated, so it won't become darker once you seal the paint job. And the yellow green is, in my opinion, one of the best paints for highlighting Soviet armor. Because if you look up some images from those tank scrapyards in Ukraine or Afghanistan, you'll see that a very faded Soviet green is basically XF4 yellow green from Tamiya, but on another note, it makes the 4BO lighter without taking away its vividness and richness. This first layer of highlights was pretty generous, although I applied it over most like 95% of the surface, I spread it in a mottled uneven pattern. The original 4BO is very dark, so there was no way I was going to work with a surface like that. The second highlight was the same mixture, just with more yellow green. I never work with measured ratios, but if the first layer was, let's say, 70% 4BO and 30% yellow green, then this layer is 50-50. Now I'm applying it in a more controlled manner, creating subtle gradients, very fine random texture on those horizontal plates, but also trying to spray some artificial shadows on the gnarly cast texture, letting it create those shadows on its own, so to say. One cool thing about post shading is how you can decide where you want to push the paint. If I wanted a more desaturated, dull looking tank, I'd use XF57 buff. 
However, this time I felt like my display case really needs another happy looking tank. And the military green color with vivid yellowish tones has its own specific charm. It was also at this point that I started to add subtle contrast and distinguish some components from each other, such as the more saturated and brighter engine hatch. So that's two layers of highlights and at this stage the model looks pretty good already. This would make a very good base for Red Ring, but I like to push things further and get the most out of the base coat. So the final highlight will be the previous mixture, but now I added a few drops of XF21 Sky. Okay, this highlight is a bit extreme, that's why I'm using it in very limited amounts and only on the most, well, extreme surfaces. Upper edges of plates, small protruding details, that kind of stuff. I opted against using more yellow green because I was afraid the tank would start becoming more yellow than green and I'm not building a disassembled vehicle that's been sitting under the sky for, I don't know, 20 years. So the sky paint, as if that wasn't confusing enough, makes it less saturated while at the same time making it lighter. I somehow feel that this still captures the typical Soviet protective 4BO, but at the same time the surface isn't boring. But also the shading isn't too over the top. Yeah, I mean just right should sum it up perfectly. So let's apply some markings. I like to gloss before decals because it makes my life easier and most importantly the varnish creates a protective barrier against decal setting solutions that might otherwise start attacking the paint. And yes, you heard that right, I'm using water slide decal on the roughest cast surface ever. Because I'm not a fan of masking, I just find decals more convenient. And I also like the challenge. Tamiya decals are actually one of the best I've worked with. What I really like about decals is how I can keep repositioning them until I'm perfectly satisfied with their layout. That's the convenience of decals, but nope, this doesn't look convincing at all. It's like a sticker, right? And we need to make it look more like this. So how do we achieve this painted on look with decals, you might ask? Well, it's very simple. Just a decal setting solution of your choice, in this case a decal softener from Gunze, and a lot of patience. And, and a stiff brush, of course. Basically, you need to let the softener do its magic and then you'll forcefully press the decal into the rough surface until it traces every imperfection perfectly. <laughs> the decals might shrivel up a little during this process, but they usually return back to their normal shape. Sometimes we can face problems with the carrier film being too visible, but I don't know what happened here, either the film got dissolved and I hammered it into the surface, or it's one of the best sets of decals ever, because there was no visible edge around them. And hey, if you smash them long enough, you might be able to add some subtle chipping effects. So yeah, that's a pretty sweet result, isn't it? I was very impressed with these. Okay, not every marking is gonna be a water slide decal though, so let's prep the surface with some heavy chipping fluid. Two layers to be extra safe. So what makes an IS-2 from Berlin so interesting are those large identification stripes. They were applied very hastily by hand, most likely with chalk or lime, but instead of meticulously painting them with a paintbrush, I just sprayed them. First off, it's faster and second, I can use that chipping fluid underneath to add some authentic wear and tear. But what about those smooth airbrushed edges you might ask? These are not a problem at all, thanks to the chipping medium, because after activating the fluid with tap water, I can not only chip the stripes but also remove those soft edges. The super rough cast surface underneath makes this process easier, because the paint will go off those raised textures like nothing. I wasn't worried about the number of chips at all, because I'll be going over those markings with a paintbrush, but not just yet. Okay, so that's the markings. I wanted to build this bare IS-2 for the longest time and I can't wait to finish weathering it, but first there's one more thing that can improve the post shading. Ammo shading, <laughs> with shaders from ammo. I wasn't totally impressed with them at first, but after a few more tries I started liking them. So much so that I find them infinitely easier to use than that homemade dirt concoction I was using before that, remember? A mixture of black and brown Tamiya paints with a lot of lacquer thinner. 
With that mixture I had to outline surface details right after laying down the basic color, so I could then refine the effect with highlights. It was just hard to control, but with these acrylic inks, they're very predictable and if you make a mistake, they can be wiped off with tap water. Because of these positive properties, I can comfortably outline the details as a finishing touch. Not only the model looks more interesting with almost every surface detail outlined, but the grimy color also makes it look more military-like, as if it saw some action already. Although we're just laying down the basic colors for now. But okay, let's now improve the markings. I sprayed some very diluted 4BO highlight along with the shader over these. Yup, they look nasty like that, but it was for a good cause. Because now they'll have their own visual texture, as if they were painted by hand and the paint coverage wasn't the greatest. It doesn't take much, but it makes a noticeable difference. Especially if the decals are too perfect and we want to make the markings less perfect. But the greatest difference can be achieved on those large stripes. It's basically the same principle as painting a winter camouflage. You spray the white, somewhat translucent, add the chipping effects and then paint over it with diluted white in this patchy pattern. This technique is called mapping and it's a very old school way of adding texture. And while we're at it, let's add some runs of dripping paint. Because those were very common on these tanks and they add that delicate touch of unperfection, if that's even a word. <laughs> So after this was all done, I could seal the model with a thick coat of varnish. The model was playing with all kinds of flat, satin and glossy lights and shadows, and this will not only give it a nice unified finish, but it'll also be a great foundation for oil paints, enamels and other weathering effects. On my last two models I went with a flat look, but this heavily textured surface was asking for a smoother satin varnish, so we could appreciate the texture a little bit more. The last thing that had to be painted and not painted at the same time were tracks. I was afraid of how these would react with the blackening fluid because I took them from an old IS-3 model where they were weathered with acrylics and pigments. I mean, I cleaned them in acetone, but there was still a little bit of residue. However, the VMS blackening bath is so strong that nothing will stop it. And yeah, the resulting surface is awesome. They already look properly weathered, although it was just a blackening bath. Needless to say, it's a great foundation for weathering. And with that, the grizzled IS-2 is ready for weathering and detail painting. It's been a super long time since I did a Soviet tank in 4BO. I think the last one was the KV-220-2 and that was like the first year of this channel. And it was in a winter camouflage, so that doesn't really count, but... Before that, I made an IS-2 in a 100 scale, remember? <laughs> but that was like a toy compared to this one. So hey, I hope you found this painting video just as refreshing as I did when I was actually working on it. The painting definitely reminded me why I used to be a fan of Soviet armor. One of the reasons being the 4BO is just too fun to paint and weather. Actually, I think that's what we'll do in the next video, because right now the model is just base coded. Up next is obviously detail painting, chipping, washes, rust effects, stowage, dust and so on. Anyway, thank you for watching my friends and also thank you to my patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing, wanna get more of it and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of rewards would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos, so you could watch the next one right now. Also these beautiful studio photos, which you can download in full resolution. And last but not least, some real-life references for dioramas, sceneries and landscapes. And of course, small 3D models for detailing your tanks and dioramas. Alright, so I'm not sure how I'll proceed next. Uh, part of me wants to do all the acrylic work first, just to see how a model can look without any enamel or oil treatment. But we'll see in the next video what we'll come up with. And you, my friends, in the meantime, stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!